This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. Well, my phone, uh, phone just said 705, so I'm going to begin. I did not hear from Cindy. I did hear from Paul, and he's excused because of a, a business commitment. But I'll uh, open the meeting for the Southampton Planning Board September 21st, 2022. And we're on Zoom and also on East Hampton Media Charter 191. Uh, we have Richard Harris, the board consultant with us tonight. And as I said, all members are present except Cindy Palmer right now and um, Paul Fergal. Um, leading off the uh, agenda tonight is Ken Comia from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, who has been uh, working on a grant with the board that was um, awarded to help us with finding ways to, um, in zoning, to create some uh, affordable housing options for us. And uh, I'll let Ken start his presentation and um, we'll go from there. I think probably it's uh, the initial findings you've got and then we'll probably uh, work on this as time goes on, but um, Let's hear what you've got so far, Ken. Sure. Um, thank you, Paul. And um, like I said, it's great to see everyone. Um, as um, Paul mentioned, this yeah, I imagine that you know this be this being a meeting since I haven't seen the board and haven't really like uh, provided any sort of context by which we are uh, the town may be examining on how to. Um, allow for uh, additional housing development, particularly affordable, um, I think maybe some of this initial conversation will be helpful to guide, you know, the next steps. Um, I will say that um, initially, and then we can schedule at the next meeting, what that next meeting will look like, but um, I've taken a look at the accessory dwelling units by law, um, how multifamily is addressed within the zoning and to an extent will examine the cluster development. Um, I haven't yet fine tuned, I guess the approach regarding infill, um, that that was something that was identified and I did not look at the inclusionary zoning um, for this the conversation. Um, so we could take a look at the inclusionary zoning. I think as we had talked about at the last meeting, which was in the spring, um, um, it may be not be it may not be lifted to the top as far as something immediate. Um, however, um, it's something that I would love to help with, and I and I have been getting more um, um, discussion with communities on how to improve their inclusionary zoning bylaw. Um, before I'll also you, before you go any further, I'd, I'd like to welcome Ryan Gielaher is here from the ZBA, and Jim Sini has just joined us from the Housing uh, Authority, but. I think you're right, and the uh, board members can um, confirm this, that we thought that you're, you're right, that inclusionary would be put at the back of uh, the list, um, seeing as how uh, convoluted that bylaw is, and uh, we can work at that down the road. We're looking for some, some um, factors here to get us some quick action down the road that's doable. And we know the inclusionary might take, uh, it's going to be a work in progress. So continue on, Ken. Yeah, so um, examining first, and I think what I've learned from the housing production plan process, as well as talking to the board and looking at your uh, zoning bylaw, um, accessory dwelling units and making those easier to permit um, based on the language that currently exists may be something that is low hanging fruit. Um, obviously, um, this discussion of accessory dwelling units and multifamily have been given us a, a spotlight um, for um, the conversation of the housing crisis in the state. Obviously, we hear about it, but it's mostly pertaining to um, Eastern Mass. However, 
you know, I, a lot, I think a lot of the concepts here um, can be something that the, the board can consider. I know in working um, with communities on this particular bylaw, the accessory dwelling units bylaw, um, that um, th they're amending them. Um, actually, I'm working with two communities that are amending them to allow them by right um, and allow a detached product as well um, by special permit. And I think one of the, the reasoning why that they are approaching it that way is um, this particular um, um, finding from the most recent uh, housing choice legislation is how to get a zoning bylaw passed with, with regards to these housing concepts. For accessory dwelling units, um, allowing them as of right um, and examining how to do that within the town. Um, obviously, I've identified that Southampton allows them, but um, by special permit. Um, with that said, um, Southampton also only allows an attached product. Um, so there are some components, I think, of the accessory dwelling unit concept that if the town is um, open to exploring detached products, having a conversation about that, as well as examining maybe where and or if um, accessory dwelling units, um, if they're allowed, um, if they can be done by uh, site plan approval or by right, um, by but with a site plan approval um, or administrative approval by the building department. Um, other concepts that I've been finding is uh, owner occupied. I think that's probably typical. You know, there's a lot of communities that have the owner occupied requirement. Um, I don't know if there's anything changing within Southampton that you may want to address um, something different. Um, also, Southampton currently only allows for a 600 feet um, maximum uh, size. Um, for an accessory apartment. Um, within the language of the housing choice legislation, it's 900 square feet um, is the maximum side size. I've also seen it um, 900 square feet maximum or um, half the size of the principal dwelling. Um, so, you know, that could be something that possibly uh, affects the um, ability to permit these more easily. Um, and yeah, in reality, I think the way that, um, you know, one of those maybe quick fixes and or discussion points right now is, is how open and, um, you know, what types of concerns the planning board may have and maybe suggesting an amendment for by right, um, or a larger, um, accessory dwelling unit. Um, and a detached versus attached. Shall we ask for comments before you go to your next uh, phase, Ken, or how do you want to handle it? Um, I don't know. I guess, uh, you know, maybe it might make sense just to go through the rest and then um, just take comments as, as they come in. Um, but that was some of the initial um, observations regarding the accessory apartments. Um, and that usually is the low hanging fruit, as I mentioned. Many communities are currently um, looking at amending their bylaws um, because of the ease of getting it approved at town meeting. Um, whether or not that's the case in Southampton, that, you know, that is the case. The um, I guess my only comment about accessory apartment, I like the, I love the idea. My, my only concern is that they could be, would become like Airbnb, Airbnbs or like rental or like day hotel type rentals yeah. and, and trying to prevent that from happening because it doesn't really help the, the problem that we're trying to solve. If it just becomes another uh, uh, high priced rental unit by day. Yeah, no, you're right. Dan, and that is something that has come up in the conversations is, you know, by allowing or making it e more easier, more easily, more easily permitted um, for these accessory dwelling units, does that open the door to now having these as um, 
you know, Airbnbs, um, those types. And I don't know currently if Southampton is dealing with Airbnbs and trying to enforce um, or if there is no enforcement mechanism for that. But that I think that's something that can be controlled within the accessory dwelling unit bylaw. Um, it also suggests in the housing choice legislation that, um, and I'm going to highlight it here because I see it, this is verbatim, um, restrictions or prohibitions on short-term rental or accessory uh, of accessory dwelling units. Um, and you already do that to an extent with the, with the requirements for um, um, filing your, your documents at the, you know, at the um, clerks. Thank you. Richard, you have your hand up. If I can make a suggestion that I don't think concern about short-term rentals should be play a factor in how you want to approach this issue. I think if there's issue concern about short-term rentals, then the planning board should suggest to the select board a general bylaw to regulate short-term rentals, period. And, and that should be a separate action altogether. Uh, regulating short-term rentals can be a benefit to addressing affordable housing because what's prompted the issues in Boston has been the fact that short-term rentals are eating up of the small A affordable housing in Boston. And that's, that's why Boston's has pushed so strongly to address that issue. And I would suggest the same thing. If, if you've got an issue with short-term rentals, whereas Airbnb or any of the other platforms address that as separate general bylaw altogether. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the right approach. Yeah, I personally think that we should definitely, you know, make it so these are easier to permit, maybe by right. I do think that the the disconnected building may be something that is um, gets more pushback. Uh, I don't know what other people's thoughts are, but it just starts to, you know, if something attached to, you know, kind of a, say it was a mother-in-law suite or whatever that turns into an apartment um, doesn't impact, you know, if you're driving by, if it looks like a one family home versus if you're putting a cottage next to your house, um, it, it looks different. I, I think that, I don't think that, I don't personally have an issue with that um, as much as I think it might be the hardest part of this to, I don't know, get by a town meeting. If I can also jump in on that, and that's a good point. This issue that South Hadley ran into and reason we never really got into that because it a lot of other issues on, on it. But what you might want to look at is the size of the parcel because for smaller lots anyway, when you start adding a second unit, that's going to impact their ability to meet septic requirements. It's easier if you got within existing building because you're not taking up land that you might need for the fill. If you're building a separate detached structure, the likelihood you're going to start impacting the um, Title V uh, compliance on small lots. If it's a five acre piece of property and they're going to have an old barn converted, that may be a different story that you want to consider. So you may look at parcel size when you start looking at detached. Yeah, good when, point. when I've seen um, the detached, when I think of a detached uh, apartment, I think of an apartment that's above a detached garage or, um, yeah, that's what, I, what I'm thinking of. I've seen that and in, in, we saw that the conservation commission was an apartment on it above an attached garage. And, um, and similar to like what, what's on, Fle on Fletcher farm, they have the marketplace and then their apartment above it. So I don't see it as just like a single detached uh, building that's just for the purpose of an apartment or um, I see it as something, something that is, multi-uses so an existing structure joy with a possibility of the second floor to be used for park right yeah that that's pretty easy to swallow i think oh, yeah. 
it, the biggest the biggest issue with accessory detached buildings is this tiny home concept that people will use that as a way to put in a accessory. But I, I think you're right. It, when it's a detached existing structure and you're going to incorporate that into a portion of that structure, that should be easy sell. Well, and it, it sounds joy that as um, you've worked with the conservation commission on that, that maybe that type of Oh, no, no, we didn't work on it. We noticed oh. we noticed it when we were doing a project and we're like, we're not sure if that was permitted. Okay. <laughs> you see a lot when you do. Sure. <laughs> you do no, contact. that makes sense. I'm just, but I'm just saying like, that's what I think of. <laughs> we did not work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's great. That's a great note. I, I think um, th that may be the more palatable option, right? So if, if you are either planning to do a detached garage, if your house currently doesn't have one, um, and I don't know um, if you have the ability of having multiple, like if you, if you already have a garage, can you build another garage? I don't know, um, within the town. Um, but Presumably, if you already have an existing building or want to build a garage with an accessory dwelling unit, then that is something that can be permitted with special permit. And the housing choice legislation suggests that um, that can only that that if the town were to that could be um, approved with a simple majority um, if you do a special permit for, with a detached product um, and a sing and a um, by right for a, an attached product. So um, those might be more palatable if you present it that way. So let's talk about the scenario with uh, new houses, right? So someone wants to build a new uh, new home and they want, want to include an accessory apartment. Um, are we saying that it could not be an accessory apartment standalone. It would have to also that building in which the accessory apartment is housed would also have to serve some other purpose. I, I don't know. Richard? Let me throw in a question. Um, we've talked about accessory problem within existing structure. Somebody has a 2,000 square foot house. They take out permit to do a 600 square foot addition to the house. Okay, they're going to put a bedroom, additional bathroom in there, and they're going to have some family space. Can they then convert that into an accessory apartment? Uh, I didn't hear a kitchen. <laughs> well, but they haven't added that yet. That's that wasn't part of their initial plan, but or there was they just didn't want to announce it. And uh, it's pretty easy to put a kitchen once you get the plumbing and wiring in that you would do as part of the addition. And the reason I asked that is that one of the questions that came up when we were dealing with this South Hadley, and the effort was houses had to be predate had to predate the accessory unit by five years. The because they didn't want somebody to come in and do an addition and then get a uh, announce they're going to do accessory apartment by right. Uh, so that, that's the question to look at is, is that a concern to you? If it's not, you don't need to worry about it. If it is, then you need to address it. Or because part of the, usually the interest in allowing by right in an existing building is it's not increasing the footprint. But somebody adding on to the house for the purpose of then come back and converting that additional space is increasing the footprint. Is there an inherent issue though with doing an addition? Even if you came and said you were going to create an accessory apartment, it was a 600 square foot addition. I mean, if it's going to be attached to your current home, I don't see that as an issue personally. But that's an issue for Southampton side if it is issue or not. It was in South Hattie. It may not be in Southampton. 
Uh, the, the idea was that people were concerned that it would then look alter the appearance of the neighborhood if you had a neighborhood of 2,000 square foot houses and then somebody's bumping up and 8,000 square foot and that's the accessory apartment they're adding on. That was a concern by folk, folks opposed to it. But there's you know, something you all decide if it's an issue for you or not. I kind of like the way Ken wrote it out here where he had taken this this um, this text from chapter 40A, section 1A, where it says the size is, you know, half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 900 square feet, right? Because that's that seems to limit them. And also the fact that the property or the parcel also has to support uh, appropriate septic uh, system. Those two things, I think, uh, would allow uh, more, much more flexibility without over restricting it. Yeah, the septic thing is interesting too, because most septics are sized by bedroom. And so realistically, that might be a limiting factor for a lot of people. Yeah, because doesn't that, if someone <clears throat> was going to build with the, in, with the future intent of putting something on, they'd have to size their septic accordingly. Otherwise it could be um, rejected by the Board of Health, right? I mean, I, I think you can only have as many bedrooms as your septic is sized for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that that needs, I mean, I don't know if it needs to be covered in here, but just practically that, that may be a, a constraint for some people. Um, but I, I agree with Dan. I don't have it. I like, you know, the language from chapter 40A and I also think whenever we can, if, you know, it works for us, use some of this language from the, you know, the state is, Kind of no reason not to. Okay. Ken, you want to move, move along? Yeah, sure. Let me stop share with that one. So I think what we'll do from here is maybe give you a cleaner version and it just would be a, a point of discussion um, for your next meeting um, as to if you're willing to adopt those particular um restrictions and our criteria um you know that is just uh there's a zoning bylaw amendment for you to to take and, and do what you wish um let me share this so um this next um document was uh, to look at how multifamilies are addressed, uh, addressed within the zoning bylaw. Um, and what I've been finding and um, what may be some conversation, and I, I don't know if, if Richard has brought this, but I know in working with some municipal planners, they're trying to take the conversation about families out of definitions and rather relying on for instance, this language, which comes from the housing choice legislation for multifamily housing, means a building with three or more residential dwelling units. Obviously, you have to amend some of the other definitions um, to address that. Um, but um, that is something that um, just for clarity purposes and, and you know, ensuring best practices within the discussion of um, dwelling units. Um, similarly, the dwelling for two family, um, the language you have in the bylaw specific to the words families, um, however you define that. Um, and a suggestion is, um, again, relying on structure, the structure and what, how, how the structure is constructed, basically. Um, Wait, uh, sorry, I... I, I didn't take that all in. Um, so is it, in, instead of saying family, how do they phrase it? So if, yeah, if you look at this, it says a building containing two dwelling units joined side by side, sharing a common wall for all or substantially all of its height and depth. It's okay. very technical okay. based on the construction of that structure, of that building. Okay. Um, okay. 
it still says family. It's just, but then it defines the buildings. Uh, yeah, it, it defines more it detail. more technically what the structure mm -hmm. is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, this would obviously require a look at how you define building and how you define the other dwellings. Um, um, and it's important to also note, a two-family dwelling does not include a detached single-family dwelling with an accessory apartment. Um, so that whole concept of accessory apartments is here. Um, so I think, you know, similarly, when we did this in the um, housing production plan, identifying where you allow for two-family or uh, multi-family dwellings, um, relying on um, special permits by the Board of Appeals and um, your uh, two of your residential districts, the neighborhood and the village. Um, and then and for multifamily, your um, uh, village and commercial village um, zoning districts where you require special permits for that type of housing. Um, you know, understanding that maybe a discussion for the board to have and examine is looking at how to create a zone where two family and multifamily are allowed outright. Um, you know, that's probably a, a um, you know, a, a discussion point. Um, so examining if those particular districts would be amenable to having that type of so instead of having an S here, here, having P's, um, that's something to consider. Um, or a site plan review by the planning board. Um, typically, that's how it would be done, um, especially if there's ad additional density. You have in your zoning bylaw um, a section where you talk about multifamily dwellings and um, I guess there is a slight inconsistency with the fact that you allow for um, multifamily dwellings within the commercial district. Um, and if you want, you know, this to also apply there. Um, but I understand based on the fact that you have minimum square feet, um, that might not be the case. Um, I think the only things that I found within the, the criteria you've, you've adopted for the town um, and identifying maybe why it may be other than requiring a special permit for for it for uh, multifamily dwellings is there are components of the town where you would need a special permit anyway because it's in the water protection um, overlay um, a majority of um, some of those areas um, you do have a village residential village districts. Um, that's the yellow, if I'm remembering correctly, according to your zoning map, um, where that's not in the overlay. Um, is that something that maybe you allow for two families outright um, or by, by site plan? Um, that obviously would um, be something for uh, the, the town to decide and probably have um, some advocacy towards. Um, I identify that um, with regards to required spaces per unit, I've seen one and a half, I think two is probably um, similar, um, but you know, that's just something that I've seen elsewhere. Um, the requirement for public water, uh, obviously we've identified this also in the housing production plan is the in-town infrastructure and um, you know, the ability um, to have public water um, and or public sewer um, where that where those lines are and how that exists within the town boundaries. Um, and that was, I mean, so multifamily dwellings, the biggest comment and what I have um, presented in the housing production plan is that maybe there's an opportunity to find um, where, those types of two family or multifamily, maybe even just two family uh, would be allowed by right or with a site plan review. 
Um, yeah. I guess I want to talk about the one you have highlighted about the water because if I think about our town, we don't necessarily have uh, water routed on every street, right? So we're really limiting. I feel like that's a really limiting uh, bullet and something we should discuss. You know, I, I understand the, the purpose of, of wanting to have the, the fire department have easy access to uh, to water, right? But um, it does definitely limit the options. And if you think of any other house in that area, they're still good. They'd have the same issue about the fire department as well. Richard? <laughs> uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised that Ken didn't say anything about item two. Uh, under 275 because that one basically says you don't have to have any open space for uh, housing for the elderly or one bedroom units, but if you're going to do three bedroom units, you got to have 2,000 square feet of open space per bedroom. Uh, to me, that is a exclusionary housing. That's for very bedroom. limiting, yes. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it makes it so that no developer in the right mind would want to do three bedroom units. They would do one, maybe two bedroom, cause that's only 500 square feet of open space, but there's no developer in the right mind would go out to three bedroom more. And that that has the effect of based on families don't come in. Brian, any comment on that? Um, so Dan, just for a point of clarification, the, the issue with the water is with through a DEP regulation, I'm not 100% sure what the threshold is on multifamily. It triggers a public water system with a well if it's over a certain number of units or you know users in the, in the property. So that I think they kind of put that in to capture it because it, it, it. it gets pretty tricky. I mean, they do it in a ro lot of rural areas, but you know, you fall under the same guidelines as the town does for, for weekly testing or monthly on the, on the water. Mm -hmm. um, if you can scroll back to the, the chart, please, Ken. Yeah. Thank you. So two family dwelling, multifamily dwelling, cluster development. This is a tough one. We, we touch on the affordable we need it, we want it, we're trying to fit it. Where, what can we do? How can we do it? Commercial villa, there's not a ton of that in town. Commercial highway, kind of same thing. I mean, we should probably look at, you know, I don't think we need to save commercial highway for, you know, the targets, the Walmarts, et cetera, of the world. I don't see that coming. And I don't think any of us really need that. But I think it might open up a little bit more. You're on the Route 10 corridor, some other areas in there, which then hopefully in the near future, you're gonna get more public utilities such as sewer. Um, and those are the areas that's gonna go more likely than in the RR area, which I think sake of conversation, Crooked Ledge and Fulmer and, and those areas are the RR where the CV is down uh, by Cumberland Farms, the RVs in that area and some other areas, there's some large RV sections. I mean, just comments, thoughts on that? So you're talking mostly about multifamily, not two family, when you're talking about getting down to Route 10, right, Ryan? Um, yes, and uh, so perfect example, the, the house, right across from me on 39 College Highway. Uh, it was torn down. You know, that's a commercial highway lot. There's some environmental issues there, such as natural heritage, wetlands, floodplain, et cetera. I mean, it's, you're not gonna put a dollar general in there. The footprint's not big enough. What a perfect spot to put a, a, a duplex or a triplex if, if, it, if it deems necessary. Um, and when you do something like that, you're able to control the cost. You know, you're getting more out of your dollar and your housing is going to be more affordable. And I mean, it's kind of a shame that that's a CH zone area and you can't do 
a two family dwelling, but you can do, uh, well, actually one single family isn't permitted in there either, but those other houses were built, you know, pre pre zoning. Yes. So just, yeah, I don't food. disagree with you. I was more saying, if anything, I think we should also, you know, allow duplexes, um, two family more kind of maybe anywhere. I mean, I think that a one family is allowed. And then I think multifamily has more of the issues like with the, the water that you mentioned, but mm -hmm. you don't have any areas that are such heavy commercial that if somebody doesn't want, wants to put multifamily housing in and they think, you know, that the market will, I don't know, fill it. Um, I don't think there's an issue with that personally. Isn't the, wasn't some of the idea for multi and especially multifamily in the CV and uh, RV um, because of the walking distance to services and uh, shops? Right. Yes. I mean, I, Paul, I think you're, you're a spot on with that, but I think the thing we need to look at is like the big picture and I'm not trying to identify properties particular, but let's take the old Harley property that that is vacant. And I mean, we got to look at the uses, not just today, now, but down the road. And I mean, it's taken how long to go through and revamp these. And we've all been working on this quite a bit. I mean, it, I don't think anyone's going to come back and have the have to want to redo this in 20 years from now. But it it just opens up some different things and maybe like that building could be, could be multi-use and, you know, they do different things like in the Red Rock shops area, you know, you might end up with multi um, multi-use housing and, in, in, in brick and mortar stores in there down the road as well. I mean, it gets a little tricky, but I mean, a lot of other towns are successful with it. Northampton, East Hampton, just to name a few, they're able to kind of do some things mixed. And, and when you can, take a structure and have multiple uses in there and in, you know, a second story or such, um, you're able to do it on a footprint. I mean, the biggest thing driving it is, is the public's public sewer is, is really the biggest hurdle there, but you're in that area, that's commercial highway. It's like one of the bigger commercial highway zoned areas in town. Um, <clears throat> Backing up on that property that's across the street from you, I had in the last couple of years at least two or th if not three inquiries about duplexes um, in that area, which currently aren't allowed. But you're right. They're small lots. They're not very deep. And you're right. Something commercial in there is going to be uh, practically uh, a real crapshoot to get any anytime, uh, anytime in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I think, generally think the more places we can allow housing, the, the better. Yep. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, I know that there's some um, communities that have, um, so, you know, it obviously, obviously can be addressed here, but um, special permits to do a conversion from a single family to a two family, um, that's that may be something um, with regards to some of the, single family homes along College Highway. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's something to also kind of be in that same vein of or allowing for two family or multifamily along that corridor. Any other so, thoughts? Jim? No, uh, oh. Jim Sini, you got any comments here? Muted. Your audio, Jim. Pardon me. There you go. And then I know it looks like Richard has a point also, but I'll just say first, none of these changes that would allow accessory dwelling or um, a duplex, whatever, they're not going to change the basics of um, requirements, right? You still got to be so many feet from the boundary line, et cetera. That's not going to change, right? This wouldn't override that. Is that correct? Unless the town wanted to, um, but typically, no. You would have certain dimensional requirements for if you've now established that you have a two-family 
and um, in a certain zone, whatever the dimensional requirements are for that building, that would still be applicable. Um, so I think, you know, this is these particular changes that we may be identifying are specific to allowing for these new uses of denser development or, you know, additional housing units in parts of town that haven't, you know, that that those parts of town haven't had that ability to develop those types of uses. Okay. Cause that, that would address if people had concerns about changing the character of a neighborhood, you know, that you keep it still. <clears throat> the other thing I would say is I, I just, just um, strongly agree with Sarah. I think what Ryan was saying too about expanding where we think housing can be like commercial highway. The examples given were great in my opinion. And there's a, there's a, a false belief. That's my perception out there that some think, you know, we shouldn't take away commercial opportunities in town because, you know, they'll pay a higher tax rate and all our taxes will go down. The reality is the tax rate's the same, is my understanding, for the commercial versus residential. So looking at the number, you know, we've got a few empty storefronts in town, right? So it's not like people are banging down to, to buy commercial property and, and put things up here, it seems. So that's another worry I don't have, you know, if, if a commercial highway becomes a duplex, um, that's not a loss in my mind. That's, that's what I have. It also <clears throat> creates more of a downtown type area uh, along the commercial highway. Um, Richard. Richard. A couple of things on the accessory. One, we care about one item. I'm not sure how Southampton's bylaws are written. You'd have to take a look at it. But many bylaws, an accessory structure has a uh, less setback on the side and rear than a principal structure does. But if an accessory structure is now going to be used as essentially a second principal structure that has the potential of having some impact on the appearance of the property, the character. So you want to be sure that you're not, in effect, reducing the size setback problem for a second principal structure. You want to provide some type of protection there. I would just, on the issue of these commercial spaces aren't being developed and it's not going to be a problem, I would just note one thing. One of the issues we had in South Hadley was over the years, the town so valued single family and low density residential, it essentially made any commercial development on Route 202 and 116 South Hadley infeasible because no developer wanted to come in and deal with the fighting that would occur by putting a convenience store next to a single family home, even though it's allowed by zoning. Uh, so be, I just encourage you to be careful, be selective and be cognizant of exactly what you are doing short term and long term. The benefit from a fiscal perspective of commercial, yes, unless you have a two tier tax rate the, they're all assessed 100% at the same rate. The difference is from a fiscal impact perspective. Residential costs more than commercial for providing public services. That's just a given. Uh, you generally, generally local governments make money off commercial and lose money off low density residential especially single family and two family. Um, and some will argue multifamily, that's a whole nother debate. So just be selective, be careful, and be cognizant of exactly what you're doing and that this is what you wanna do, not just for today, but for 20 years from today. Um, one, one request I was going to make of Ken is if you could be so kind as to capture some of these comments that we're making in your, yeah. in the document you're going to submit. 
for I guess that way it, it'll be easier to to agree or disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and you know i think every community is different and any planning board that i present um either considerations or thoughts regarding possible language um they're usually like oh i like that or not at all you know we don't want that um so yeah similar to i think the way that i'm going to do for the accessory dwelling units taking into account your conversations um we'll do the same for the multifamily. i think We've had some great conversation about how you may be thinking at least along maybe some of these corridors where maybe it may make sense to have a two family or a multifamily. There's also the conversation, um, you know, and this usually involves um, other entities um, seeking um, a friendly 40B, right? Which would presumably um you know, not go through that particular permitting process and, and go through the zoning board of appeals um and bypass a lot of the regulation but um yeah i think you brought up all great points that are definitely points that if you do amend the bylaw to address maybe allowing for additional density along those corridors you're going to need to advocate, you know, and, and provide that advocacy for it and why that's beneficial. Richard? You're, you're uh, muted. In, I think it's 27558, the multifamily development section, there's item four or five deals with the frontage requirement. If I remember correctly, the French carbon for multifamily is 250 feet. Let me scroll down. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's Two, scroll down. Yeah. Uh, 250 feet. Four. What that does also is preclude some areas from being able to meet the requirement. Why is does it need to be 250 feet? Could the fringe not be 50 feet, which is sufficient to put a driveway, landscape driveway, 60 feet even, back into a larger piece of property? The 250 requires that property to eat up a lot of valuable frontage. And I would suggest maybe take a look at, should the 250 be reduced? Uh, yeah, do you know what uh, what single family is off the top of your head? No, I don't. 140. One four, depending on the zone, but 140 right. is the average. Okay, thank you. Ryan, you got something to say about that frontage? Yeah, I, I don't think we should go down to 50. I think we should, if you're going to set the threshold, it should be what the minimums require for a single family in a lot. Because otherwise, if you go down below that 140, I mean, I, I don't know what. I mean, I agree 250 is too much, but um, I think if you go below the, I think 140 is still pretty, it's pretty aggressive on a, you know, an RV uh, size lot is 30,000 square feet with 140 feet of frontage. It's not a lot of space once you put a house, a driveway, a septic system and have a reserve area for it. And if you deal with any kind of wetlands or keep any buffers. Yeah, no, I agree with your statement that I, I like it at least being equivalent to a single family. Mm -hmm. My point is you shouldn't penalize a multifamily developer. With on no, Friday. right. Paul? Oh. Yes, go ahead, Jim. So to me, 140 is, if we're trying to create housing options, is, is too much. Um, that really, I think, restricts a lot of development in town. I'm, I think what Richard was talking about sounds like a flag lot to me almost. I don't know if we want to go there, but some 140 seems like a lot to me. Um, depending on what part of town or whatever. Um, I know that's what it is now, but I think that's contributing to our our situation and our problem. 
All right, well, lack of let, let, let me jump back to Ryan then. What what would the actual minimums be for a for a, a duplex or a multifamily? What's the absolute minimum? Because if you if you if we think the 140 is too much and you want to reduce it, then that means you've got to reduce the entire acreage of it. So what's the minimum you can get away with with the septic and uh, and the like? Right. Well, there's two questions though. There's talking about a standard lot, kind of like what you've been referring to, Ryan, or there's talking about potentially a lot that opens up to a larger parcel off the street. Yeah, no. what is what does Jim mean? Just the frontage reduction, but the square footage doesn't change or both? I, right. I'm not necessarily correlating the frontage to the square footage, is my point. Because all, all lots are not square or perfectly rectangular. So, but sometimes a square foot of uh, a frontage requirement um, doesn't allow a building to happen in town where there's actually probably enough square feet for septic and everything, but there's just plain not enough frontage. Good point. <clears throat> Is the question about frontage for housing in general or both frontage for housing for multi? Family dwellings, Both, right? In my mind, yeah. There's there's no reason to uh, reduce the lot size because you have a smaller frontage. The right. frontage provides access to the roadway, and the lot size you can have much bigger lot that meets all your septic tank requirements, and. So, so there's no reason to think that there has to be a reduction in lot size if you reduce the frontage. There isn't a correlation there. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Richard, because that has come up several times over the years where people inquired about uh, developing their property, but they had a big parcel, but they didn't have the frontage. Correct. So, so Jim, what are you, what are you thinking on, on frontage? What, you have a number in mind or an I really, idea? That's a great question. Um, and I don't, I don't, that's. Um, well, Richard threw know. out 50 feet. Does that seem a little low? I mean. So, I mean, we're talking basically about a driveway through yeah. to a bigger area at that point. So if you Correct. have 20 feet for driveway, maybe, maybe more. And then do you want 20 feet on either side? I mean, it's somewhere between 50 and 75. If mm -hmm. it would be a very comfortable space to put a residential driveway. So if anyone else yeah. has thoughts on that. I feel like, is this, we're going down the road of like flag lots though? Is this? But that is what I am picturing when we're talking about this. Yes. Okay. I, I don't know if we want that, but yeah, I agree. That's what Kind of what, we're what, it, that's what it feels like a modified so, flag lock. So, so Jim, just just quick, I took 140 feet of frontage, and if you said for a multi, uh, so we could do it for for a duplex, if you said you could reduce the frontage by 20 percent, it goes to 112 feet. You know, it's a percentage, and then that way. It's what RV and RN, you can do a two family home. So I think RN is, is that 150, I believe? Once, once, is it 160 one, or 175? One, yeah. So, it, you know, it give you that. I, I don't know. So it's fair and equal for both a percentage if needed and, and put the verbiage in of that. I mean, because it reduces the 140 down to 112, which you get into 50 foot that's a right away for a road that that makes me a little nervous with someone trying to do something on a 40,000 square foot long uh, sliver type lot or something a lot of things to consider i think um you know this probably deserves um some additional research and maybe looking yeah. at some Unities um, and how they may address this idea of, um, you know, especially if you're if there's a possibility of either using a single family and converting it to two family, um, what, you know, what if anything if there if those are regulated, 
um, in the zoning um, for those types of uses. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's definitely um, something that uh, possibly could come up. But I think to Richard's point, um, it's probably the, you know, looking at 50 feet of frontage where these types of more dense developments may occur um, may, you know, may lead to that type of future development. Um, but yeah, I think that definitely I, I've taken note um, with regards to how um, it currently is um, zone or what your requirements are in your current zoning, um, but also what may be applicable um, and what may have been applicable in other communities for that type of development. I can just throw in, if I may, um, um, that we have a natural in town barrier to you know the worries we might have about flag lot development or et cetera is is just you know we don't have the infrastructure again for sewers so, so everything's got to perk everything's got to have capacity for the number of bedrooms and et cetera so that's something to consider too too yeah jim i'm i'm 100 percent behind you on creating flag lots because i think it's a great way for a use of land to get you know, there's a parcels out there that are 10, 15 acres that people would build on and be a couple hundred feet off the road. And there's a reduction in frontage. I mean, it's not going to be a free for all, but you definitely would be able to yeah. add some nice structures, which then could potentially allow other areas of town that would open up to do other things. So I don't, right. we don't, we've never talked about the flag lot, Paul, correct? To my knowledge, okay. and I and I suspect since there's probably demand to be flag lots developable that we have, we create the zoning so that it's we ensure that there's affordable units on those lots, right? Because that's what we're looking for. Yeah, right. It all gets back to <laughs> the whole goal of this of building affordable housing, right? <laughs> Not you, but it, I agree with you. I think we definitely need a, affordable housing, but we also need just a range of housing. You know what I mean? I think more housing in general. Because, a diversity, yeah. yeah. Right, diversity of housing. Um, we need to not just have more lots right. to allow for more 3,000 plus square foot so homes. So different but. labels, you're right. Is I would say, you know, we need more starter homes and what I would classify as we're calling them finisher homes, right? So I would say... We need more small A and large A affordable housing. Right. Missing middle housing is one term I've heard tossed around. Oh, yes. No, <laughs> that, that's exactly, um, Sarah, that, that's exactly what a lot of communities are facing. And, um, you know, Richard's old um, former town that he was served as town planner. I'm working with them to identify affordable housing forums for the community, um, which will address both the capital A and the lowercase a affordable, in addition to some other um, housing related forms, which um, hopefully will and probably will be open to, you know, whoever wants to listen in. But you're right. Um, they're definitely, and the housing plan does suggest that um, just housing development in general, how do you do that? Um, that could be addressed through cluster zoning too, right? Which may be a perfect segue. Um, but I don't know, is there anything um, else with regards to multifamily dwellings? Am I missing anything? Um, I have notes about um, looking at examples for um, smaller frontages. Um, as well as maybe examining how to put together a permitting mechanism for um, converging, converting one families to two families and even putting out there um, along the um, College Highway corridor, the ability at least maybe on the ends to have more dense housing. Okay. 
I think that sounds good. I think generally with this multifamily and, you know, two family housing, we should just not make it more restrictive than building a single family home. Yeah. I, I told the board last fall when I read multifamily development section, and I'll leave it up to you, Ken, how you want to approach it. I suggested just scrap it the way it is right now and write something that really is supportive of multifamily housing and reflective of the goals that Southampton has. Because right there, there's a lot of little issues within yeah, other yeah. portions of it as well. So yeah. rewrite, rewrite the whole section. The whole section, yes. Yeah, create the criteria for multifamily housing in general. Right. And right. obviously it would be applicable wherever you allow for multifamily housing right. in town. Now, and some that fits the goals of Southampton. Right. Uh, because there's probably a half dozen items in right now that I would say have the effect of being exclusionary yeah. because it penalizes multifamily and doesn't have a rational correlation to the impacts. And I, I think that's something that you should. So that might be an approach you want to take in is come up with criteria that you should be looked at. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's that's great because in at the end of the day, whatever permitting me mechanism the town may have to allow for multifamily, you're going to have to have those findings and find that they're compliant with those criteria. So if there are best practices for criteria um, for multifamily housing, definitely we should take a look at that. So I'll do some additional research on that. Well, we've had um, some other, gets good some ideas there. So continue, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Um, so finally, um, and this may be more of a selling for me because this is something that um, we started this past year and I'm going to be doing a um, some sort of publicity around um, is a, the development of a model cluster, um, a model open space residential development bylaw. So obviously your community has one. Um, it is actually smaller than... Um, than what um, the working group that I worked with, what we came up with. Um, however, I think the biggest difference, um, and uh, you know, just I, I'm not going to necessarily share your your current bylaw because I don't have notes other than you require 30 acres um, to have these open space residential developments. Um, the work that we did um, to uh, for our model. I'll share that screen. Um, is allowing them, allowing subdivision, uh, these cluster development subdivisions by right um, and with no minimum parcel size. And basically, the, the de facto development for subdivision development. Um, and so, um, you know, and one of the things that we had the benefit of, which is not typical, but we built into this particular process is the, um, is a legal review um, of, of the bylaw that the working group drafted and, and helped facilitate that conversation. Um, so the applicability is that it's allowed anywhere in town um, or in specific districts, obviously, you know, your bylaw does state where those types of developments can occur, um, and those in all your residential districts, um, and it requires a special permit of the planning board. Um, um, so the idea is, too, that um, you may have different um, housing types um, within uh, that type of plan um, in addition to um, because Southampton um, favors and has um, identified in the open space plan as well as um, in many other planning documents, um, particulars um, with regards to conservation lands and how you approach um, that component. Um, so there is, you know, there's a little bit of um, discussion, obviously, and probably identification of certain parcels that um, 
you know, may be appropriate for this type of development. Um, it may also already be established within your master plan as well as your open space plan. Um, I feel like I may have been privy to a conversation during your open space plan where maybe there was a parcel that, or maybe it was um, town, a town owned parcel where presumably this type of development either could occur or um, housing development occurs. Um, so similarly, you know, within this particular bylaw, um, it's identifying the uses that are permitted um, within an open space that are not that are prohibited within open space. Commercial cultivation of cannabis was the first thing that ro rose to the top um, for the working group. Um, um, so there's a there's a lot of language in here that is specific to what um, those uh, those protected open spaces would look like. Um, I think particularly that may be of interest to the planning board is um, really the concept of allowing subdivision development outright and requiring this particular bylaw um, to be applicable to all subdivision development. Um, it would go through um, your subdivision development process. So we probably would have to also look at your subdivision regulations um, to address those uh, components. Um, what else? Um, yeah, and there there are considerations for this yield calculation. It's just something that usually pops up when we talk about cluster development and open space development um, and providing um, some of the discussion um for what what parcels or what pieces of the parcel um, are not developable what would you have to account for when you are talking about roads and infrastructure um, and providing those percentages to come up um, with a calculation for the amount of homes that you could presumably um, build on this particular parcel um, and I will share this with you because this is going to be shared widely um, eventually once we finalize that document. Um, but for instance, um, this particular case supposes a 40 acre tract for subdivision through the OSRD bylaw, four acres of steep slopes and eight acres of wetlands to calculate net um, developable area. You do some subtraction for the slopes, subtractions for the wetlands you come up with 28 acres um, and then subtract 10% for um, roads and infrastructure. Now you have acreage of 25.2 acres. Then you do some conversions here based on um, um, uh, minimum lot size of the underlying district and come up with basically the amount of homes um, which is 18 in this case. Um, so that was particular to the one instance. Um, the PVPC uh, working group was being rather, um, so I will say during this process, there was a lot of conversation both with the preservation of important lands, um, but at the same time trying to address the need for housing. Um, and I, I think this particular bylaw was born out of the I, identifying that you want to be able to use a parcel um, to develop as much housing as you can, but be mindful that some of it won't necessarily fall under a typical standard subdivision under the subdivision law, but rather through this bylaw. Um, some additional density, flexible dimensional controls. Um, again, you know, there would be some balance that you would have to do in the subdivision regulations, um, open space requirements um, that's spelled into this, as well as bonuses for either LID, uh, low impact development, or affordability um, components, um, and then the requirements for conservation of the required open space. 
uh, what's the permanent, how that works. Um, so, you know, I think obviously this is a, a basic summary of what um, this model tr uh, tries to accomplish. Um, I don't know how your particular bylaw has worked for you in the past or if it hasn't, um, what maybe are the sticking points to address that way. Um, but this is something that, um, you know, is born out of the idea that if you want subdivision development, it's got to look like this. Um, so, yeah. Good question. Oh. <laughs> I can um, Go ahead. So have, have town uh, towns have have implemented this bylaw before? No. So this is this is. Um, this was, as I mentioned, this was reviewed by a legal team. Uh -huh. um, this was um, drafted by the working group. Uh -huh. um, but it, I think it models after a lot of the typical language. The biggest thing is this idea of making this the de facto form of subdivision development and requiring those permanently conser uh, conservation spaces, um, I think. You know, when we bring this and shop this around, there's going to be a lot of communities who are like, no, this is not going to allow for it. Um, this is too onerous. Um, but there's a lot of communities, you know, that have this idea of if you want to develop subdivisions, it, you got to do it this way. Um, so this may not necessarily address the idea of additional housing, because this also does address the idea that the town is trying to conserve important uh, recreation spaces and conservation areas. So it's more so just uh, something for you to look at and, and consider if you want to amend the cluster zoning. Um, Richard, you're muted. Yeah. A uh, couple of questions. I, I, obviously, I haven't read it. I was just trying to read it as you were showing it. Yeah. I probably read that 50% of steep slopes and 50% of the wetland areas were deducted from the area in calculating the yield. That was a, an optional consideration. Um, what the working group wanted was um removing 100 percent um so i think the optional consideration were ideas that were brought in other parts of the state that have used some of these um criteria but you're, you're right you, you did identify 50 percent of um, the calculation i re raise that because if you do a standard what i call a standard subdivision yeah you can use in most book zone biology you can use all of the wetlands as part of your lot, just so you have a buildable area yep. in the lot. Um, I, I would have some concern about the 100% deduction would actually drive up the cost of housing by reducing the yield so much that it'd make it more costly yep. to, to put the units out there. Um, who was, which communities were in your working group? This was um, Belchertown, Munson, Hatfield, Hadley, South Hadley, and East Hampton. Okay. Uh, I'll share my, my gut reaction with you is I, I understand you guys put a lot of effort into it, this new process. I, I feel a little um, cautious in using a process that's never been tried before in a right. town. You know, that it's, it's you know, we, the results uh, is something that you can say, oh, this town used it and this was the reaction that occurred. You know, so that, that, that's yeah. just my gut feeling there. But, you know, maybe I'll get you're it. Totally, you're totally right, Dan. I mean, this is, I think, going to be hard. At, really the success of it will be someone that adopts it because I think that was a conversation and that was something that I, at least East, East Hampton was probably the most kind of like, uh, okay, I think. Um, it may not work here in East Hampton, but for the more rural communities, 
they were they ate it up. Um, so Hatfield like really wants to adopt this, um, but it's not for every community. And you're right, you're gonna want you're gonna want to be cautious about when you may look at it if you look at it at all. Sure. Let, me, let me tell you what I've I'm working with another community, and one of the things I'm drafting for them is something similar to this. Essentially, what it would do is define a residential subdivision, mm -hmm. require a residential subdivision to have X percent of common open space. It, and that is by right. Yep. Allow a subdivision that does not have the required amount of open space to be approved by special permit. Yep. So that way a developer could come in and say, I really can't meet all your wetland required. I'm not getting the yield. Fine. Apply for special permit. You have to meet the criteria for special permit. Odds are they won't. And they'll have to go back and revisit. But it makes the traditional subdivision by special permit, the open space by right. Right. And basically, it reverses the tables and that it used to be more difficult to do an open space oriented development than a standard chop it up into lots type approach. Um, so that's something you can also think about is if this seems too much, maybe what I do is you, we look at this, something like this being the standard, but still allow as a special permit, one that doesn't have the, open space so it doesn't rule that out it just makes it more difficult brian what say you i'm sorry paul what what say you um i don't know i'd have to reread and go through that i i kind of skimmed it as he pulled it out but i i, I think yeah there he you've got to use the, the restricted land in um, your square footage calc to make it work because you are right. You're going to drive the, uh, <clears throat> if you got to make a three acre lot because of the percentage of, of that's non-buildable to make it work, it's going to drive the cost up even more. So you're going to kind of defeat the, the purpose, I think just briefly from what I saw, I'd, I'd like if that could be shared, to the planning board and you guys could send that along. I'd like to reread it. For sure. My question, Ken, was on that model you had with, uh, it would create 18 homes given the calculation. Well, right then and there with the inclusionary zoning, that would shoot that out of the water in this town, correct? Yeah. Because it's capped at uh, it's uh, nine. Nine, nine or under. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of considerations here, and I think it's as it's Richard it's has easy. posed, yeah, go. Cool. It's, it's either that or there's some of these communities you're working with don't have inclusionary zoning. <clears throat> that for yes, one of them didn't. Yeah. Um, but you're lift right. The, lift the inclusionary zoning. I oh, mean, yeah. Ken, just from the top of your head, how many other towns have an inclusionary zoning bylaw that you know of and the threshold is below 10? Um, I was just looking recently at some um, of the um, re reviewing some of the more um, like in our toolkit, we call this our housing toolkit. And um, in the region, I think it was East Hampton um, that I, that, you know, um, is this the document? No. But is um, in East Hampton, East Hampton per zoning section or is it overall? there's a requirement per zoning section. You're right. Right. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think with the communities that I work with, all of them have a zoning bylaw. Um, he, Hadley is trying to um, possibly look at making it smaller. Um, well, I don't know what they currently have. I have to review that, but um, they stopped talking about um, that particular aspect of inclusionary zoning. <laughs> so I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, as yeah, far I as I'm concerned, the inclusionary zoning hasn't been an effective policy th through its life in f for what it was intended to, to do, right? It's supposed to build uh, affordable housing, right? But it just caps the number of houses that were built. So, yeah, and that's you're exactly right, and that's why it's on the bottom of the list when it comes to revamping anything. But on the same token, it, it could be uh, the opening to get rid of it all altogether if you can work out something in cluster. The South Hadley doesn't have inclusionary zoning, and the reason being, we spent two years going through it, and we ultimately decided it was not going to be worth the political capital and the energy to try to get it on books because it wasn't going to accomplish a whole heck of a lot for us. And uh, so we planning board said, put that at the bottom, look at it later. When can, when do you expect this model to come out publicly? Uh, within the month, uh, within the next couple of weeks. I do like the idea of the kind of mixed buildings you have in the cluster, you know. Um, that goes through by right or whatever, or even by special permit. How how would you guarantee you would get that kind of a mix? Is there any guarantees uh, written in any of the provisions that you're going to get that type of mixture of housing? Um, there, there's an example, um, and I have to look at my notes. Um, it's an Eastern Mass, which does um, spell out ways to ident consider different housing types in their OSRD. Um, and I guess, you know, your question, Paul, is how do you um, regulate it? Sure, right? That that's part of the development program. Mm when they get permitted for this. Um, yeah, I, I, at the top of my head, I would have to review those notes, but. The problem is you really can't mandate a developer to build two family or townhouse. That's, that's largely driven by the market. Right. If the market says, yeah, in Southampton, I can sell townhouse houses all day long they're going to want to find a way to build. If the market says Southampton, I want they want single family homes. That's what they're going to build. Uh, a, a zoning bylaw can prohibit things. It can't compel a developer to build things that it doesn't want to build. No. So so some of these issues are pie in the sky unless you. You know, they, it sounds great, the type of mixed housing, but is it, would it happen? Who knows? Maybe you not. need to give incentives. Hmm. It's the incentives, yeah. Incentives is where, it come, where you can get those things done. Because okay. then, then developers put into their equations, all right, I can get these if I do this, and this becomes my return. If it's sufficient, they they won't pursue it. Then those options should be considered. Then, <clears throat> if we're going to consider this cluster uh, option, <clears throat> when we did flexible development bylaw in South Hattie eighteen years ago, whatever it was, we put a lot of these housing options in there. We're hoping people would do more townhouse and more of. Uh, actual clustering of it. The first development got approved was single family homes. Instead of going in with lots about half or third of the minimum required, they came in at about two thirds of the minimum required. It wasn't exactly what we wanted. It was better than what the cluster development had been approved 
30 years ago, but it, would, it wasn't exactly what we were aiming for. And so that's one reason uh, that we've looked at a lot of times how to better create better incentives within it to achieve the outcomes we wanted. That's kind of where my mind is, is looking at best practices across well, the state, Commonwealth, or, and um, where, where things have actually have worked and produced results uh, over, say, over 18 years, where we can actually see what parts are good, what parts were bad, and we can pick out the, uh, use something that we, we at least have evidence would work. That's, that's what I, I always try to fall back on, is using something that's been proven. My biggest hesitation about that is you have to look at the housing market you're in. Too many people have gone and looked at what they did inside 495 and said, oh, we can put that here. And when you have developers that are fighting with each other to get into a market and folks doing the regulation, those markets can create a lot of regulations that people will do. It just because builders want to be there. If your market isn't that robust, you can't do the same things because you've got to provide more incentives to make it more uh, palatable to them. Yeah, most definitely. It has to match our time, the time we're in and the town we're in. Well, Judge, is, was that your last presentation, Ken, the cluster? Yeah, it was cluster. Um, um, the reason I said that is because that seems to me like it's going to take some work, the cluster. Um, and I don't know what the board thinks or some of the other participants, um, Jim and Ryan. The other two, I think we should focus on more. I don't know. Um, it, it seems like you were saying a lot of that's low hanging fruit. And we can get some work done and then, then we can go, maybe go to cluster, um, sometime down the road. Yeah. I, agree. I think just looking at our, you know, town, oh, somebody putting a two family on a lot instead of a one family is a more reasonable target within say the next 18 months than um, a 30 acre, 20 acre, whatever it is, cluster development. I mean, I think it's something to shoot for, but might as well tackle the the stuff that's more applicable right now. My sense is once we got starting about the cluster and the number of units and everything, the the word affordable seemed to go right out of the picture because it, it, it didn't it didn't seem to fit with the other two categories we started on. You're right. Right. Yeah. Right. I, would make I think what we need to do is figure out where we can fit more housing on the same amount of land without, you know, making a major change to the, the character of the neighborhood. But um, yeah, the cluster just make, seems more complicated. I would Sorry, make a suggestion that the plan board consider in next year's DLTA request, asking PVPC to look at the town and identify areas that might be more appropriate for multifamily and cluster development. And then in the following year after that, ask for DOTA assistance to adapt the cluster housing bylaw, model bylaw to fit Southampton. So basically I'm, I'm trying to identify, and this, when I was with South Hadley, what Larry Smith and I did several with uh, PVPC, we identified DOTA projects two years out for South Hadley and did them systematically. We have to apply each year and hopefully get approved. But so I think it's, an, it's important to try to lay out what you want to try to do over the next couple of years to DOTA. I think that may be the approach to take with it. You don't think we can, we can, uh, Fit accessory apartment and multifamily in this this upcoming thing for the spring. I would do that this year. I'm talking about when you apply when you request DLTA assistance next year for the next year's program. Right. Those are the type of projects that I think look at uh, open uh, the areas for cluster areas for multifamily, and then the subsequent DLTA request for PVPC would 
be to adapt the model to Southampton. I trust you'll uh, make notes of that and remind us, please. And I, I would, again, that's my way of saying, saying put a little flag of note. That that oh, for it. sure. Well, I, you're talking. I, I love it, Richard. I love it, but I'm not going to remember that this, this time next year when the DLTA comes around. So I want you to make a note of it. And I'm, I'm having Ken just going to put a little tickler in, on his desk, Southampton, this, Southampton, that. I've noted that. And like I've mentioned to for the past two, three years that I've worked with Southampton through these various DLTA requests, it's always identifying how you build upon what you previously you know adopted and or uh, have done um so that makes sense to me um that that you would identify maybe these areas of town um where multifamily and cluster development may be appropriate and then presumably the the year after um try to adapt the model if that makes sense when i was with south hadley i, I used to attend the valley development council meetings at pvpc and Larry would announce who got DOTA approvals. And people looked at me and him said, that's three years in a row that South Hadley got a DOTA and we didn't get one. And Larry said, it's because they implemented what we gave them. We actually, we actually pursued implementation and that's the key. Helps, helps when you have a little poll too. <laughs> So would that mean for those areas of town, just hypothetically going down that path, would we end up making, do some rezoning to create those, those areas? Is that how that would be accomplished? Possibly. I would expect it could be that it could be amendment of the text of the, of the bylaw. There's a lot. It, okay. There's it, different it, ways. You can't presuppose until you actually do the research and Come up with it. Thank you. Anything else, Ken? No, um, it's coming up um, when I'm going to be uh, with the board next. Um, I have obviously some work to do with regards to the zoning bylaw language that we looked at this evening. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm excited to finish the work and have continue having this discussion. Are you available the next meeting in October? I'm all, because I work with so many planning boards and I serve as their town planner, um, I am available the second, the, your second Wednesday meeting. Yeah, that would be October 19th? Yes. You're available? I'm available. So we can, so we can pick up where we left off? or the next Yeah, meeting. and I, I will um, distribute um the the amendments or the revisions that we've noted today. Um, Feel free to talk to uh, Richard if you can kind of correlate sure. the path you want to take here, so we can keep the wheels moving. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you very much, Ken. It's very informative. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you. I, before so, you before you go, the next agenda item. Um, I just wanted your uh, comment about the material and keep the board up to date on the material you forwarded to the e code uh, people. Basically, I took everything y'all have worked on over the past how many years and cleaned it up. Where there are questions. In some cases, like the floodplain, there was a lot of blanks left in there. And the blanks were referring to putting the date of the current firm map and floodway map. And I rewrote that to basically say the current uh, edition of the firm map, floodway map. Because you put a date in there, every time they change the map, you have to amend the zoning bylaw, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I, I did a lot of uh, adjusting of it that way and provided all to uh, uh, general code. And my understanding, Deb, is going to look at what's on cost. And then so I guess she'll get with Paul or uh, town administrator, see what additional expense is going to be. But the idea is to 
come up with a rewritten zoning bylaw uh, based on what y'all have done to date. And then that would be adopted uh, as a repeal and replace article. And um, once that's done, then we can look at making changes to those to make some substantive revisions that we talked about that we haven't done yet. Um, but to get everything in the format and the proper uh, layout. Mm -hmm. And all the definitions would be in one location. Can I ask a question back on the previous subject? When, I guess, when would be, do we know when the meeting would have to occurs for getting in those two things that we consider little hanging fruit or the, the accessory dwelling in the, in the, the multifamily dwelling, if we wanted to aim for having those, getting those in, uh, well, next year, <laughs> if I doubt they'll have a meeting this year, or if there's a meeting this year, um, we have, have to go to, we have to go to public hearing Richard, maybe sometime in March, April. April might be cutting it too close. March. Uh, that'd be cutting it too close. I think you probably want to do it in February. Um, you're going to have to have a public hearing on the revised zoning bylaw. The cut that general uh, code is codifying. Okay. Uh, so you could incorporate it with it, right? Or have a separate hearing on both on them. I would have general codes as one. And these as a second, second one. Uh, it's going to be interesting, and we have to look at how we can write it, because I assume Ken is writing this in the same format as General Code. Yes. Uh, but you can't amend the code that hasn't been adopted yet. <laughs> so we'll, we'll have to. Well, we'll play with and figure out how to yeah I'm just, I'm just i guess what i'm really just trying to say is let's make it a goal yeah. to get those two items uh included the way we the way we want with the right wording for the next uh town meeting or wherever that to be approved it may be that what we would do is amend the existing bylaw by adding replacing this article putting that article in and then it gets incorporated into the uh, uh, revised bylaw uh, as a codified version of it. Well, keep in mind, even though Ken can only be with us once a month on the second meeting, if he provides us with um, the major parts of what we need to work on, we can do that um, in our you know, other meetings. And if we have to schedule a special meeting so we can keep working on this, we've done that in the past too. So we can, we can work without Ken if he provides us with some of this and we can get some work done in between rather than waiting every uh, third uh, Wednesday for him. But we don't want to deprive Ken of his opportunity to have another night meeting though. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> No, I, I will make that a goal, Paul. I think, it, especially if your agenda happens to be light, it may be helpful to have those conversations before having your public hearing um, when you're eventually going to be able to adopt this. But um, I'm happy to. And I think these, because a majority of this is already relying on your current bylaw and some of the revisions are relatively simple, I could have this for you next week and then you can maybe talk about that at your first meeting in October if that's something you want to do. All right. Sounds good. Great. Thank you. Uh that's it, I guess, Richard. So thank you folks. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Ken. That was enjoyable meeting with you again. Good to see you, Richard, and great to see the board. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all. Uh, Thank safe, you. Tra safe travels, Richard. Can you give me a drop me email or give me a call when you want to talk talk about yes, this. Yes, I will. Thanks, Rich. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, uh, I'll keep <clears throat> I'll keep you abreast of things, Jim. Um, and at 
some point, and I'll probably, when we really try to nail down how we're going to uh, finalize this, do you want to have a joint meeting at some point with your board members, or do you think um, you're going to keep attending on your own? How do you feel? I think it depends on what we're covering. I, yeah. I, the, the board is very interested in being part of this. I think this was just the first, you know, they knew that Ken was presenting. I could share things with them, but I think it's, it's something you and I can talk about, or, or I trust your discretion when we get into the workings of it, that I, I think a joint meeting makes sense. Good. Well, we'll wait to hear from him the next time what he gives us, and perhaps then we can, looks like uh, maybe the first, meeting in November or something like that, we can get a joint meeting to go and um, start crafting the language. Sounds agreeable. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, folks. I appreciate Paul and the board for letting me join you. And I'm looking forward to ongoing collaborations. Thanks. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Well, let's see. Just a little bit more here to cover. Not much, but... Uh... Just some things going on. Um, I got an email from Randall Kelt from Highway that the MS4 stormwater uh, is up for the annual uh, report. So I've got to fill out some material for him regarding um, any stormwater permits we issued in, since um, July of 21 through June of 22. Um, I think Ty and Bond is handling the report, but they need some information from us. Um, the only thing that troubles me about it is because we were the so-called name, the um, stormwater management authority on that MS4 bylaw, as you recall, that um, looking about information re relevant to um, inspections and enforcement actions. I certainly haven't done any inspections. I knew that that <laughs> was, was where this thing was leading. I mean, we, we, we issue the permit where the authority, but now they're looking, you know, I don't know how stringent they are going to be on uh, inspections, but uh, maybe that's a conversation I'll have to have with Randall. So right, I think, to, go ahead. I was just going to say, if, if, Inspections are something that become required. Then we have to bake into the cost of the for the the person requesting it to have some entity perform those inspections. Well, so, right now it's going to come out of our pocket. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> That's what we got to fix. Yeah. <laughs> um, in addition to that, uh, I got an email because I was up. Uh, at the Greg Felton property there on High Street. Remember the uh, precast uh, culvert uh, yeah. that had to be installed. Yeah. You all remember that. Um, it was installed finally because I was up visiting him in July and it hadn't been done at that point. And I said, well, it's been a pretty dry summer here, so had an extension till August and uh, he emailed me as I followed up on it. He said it was installed, but I asked him for pictures and a letter from his uh, engineer to confirm that um, it has been installed and that all the measures that he was asked to do for the property there have been uh, taken care of. It looks, it looked pretty pretty stable to me all the work they've done up there with the exception of that culvert so um hopefully i get some pictures on that to verify it otherwise i'll have to draw drive up and take my own uh letter from the board of selectmen the select board that they too waived their uh, right of first refusal on that fisher property that we uh waived our right on the last meeting upon uh homer and crooked ledge uh, I think you might have seen my email regarding Gill Farm. Yeah. I, I won't mention the, uh, par the party uh, publicly, but I was, I was not very happy with, with uh, 
being talked to like that and um, criticized. I mean, the just subdivision regulations are what they are. Uh, I can't help it if somebody in town uh, who's in the construction business or building business doesn't know how to read them or doesn't understand them. But it's I followed that conversation up with John Furman, our uh, board uh, consultant engineer that does the peer review on, on those sites. And for that matter, he's hired by the town of Southampton for um, many of their other engineering consulting. And he said, it, I was absolutely right. We, we the sidewalks go in, the, the sub base goes in and the top coat goes on, whether there's, um, you know, we're not waiting for people to build before these things are done. And um, I had to write to the building inspector to tell him that, you know, um, if anyone that's building out there is gonna damage the sidewalks and the, uh, the curbings and whatever else, they're gonna be liable for it. The, the, uh, the, the uh, developer and, uh, and the owner of the property there are gonna be on the hook for it. So. In the town, the road won't be accepted if, if there's damage done. So um, it just was very, you know, we don't get paid to listen to that type of stuff. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't like it and I didn't need it. And um, I had to cut the conversation short because I wasn't getting anywhere. So. If it matters at all, uh, we apologize uh, for them, and uh, sorry you had to go through that. No, thank you. Uh, but the regulations are there. It's spelled out what has to happen, and uh, it's not that those were developed in the last year, two years, five years. They've been in place for several years, um, so that's that. And anyway, the sidewalks were, were installed at uh, Gill, Gill Farm. Um, you may have seen John Furman's letter uh, in the uh, top coat, I'm assuming will be going on before the snow flies, but uh, they've got some other issues regarding a storm drain that was fractured or something else, but he's keeping on top of it. And uh, I thank him for that. Uh, we have a public hearing coming up on um, the 19th also, that same night that uh, Ken, no, did I say the 21st of October? No, it's the 19th, I'm sorry. We have an application in for a stormwater permit for some uh, storage units that are going to be uh, proposed to be erected on Valley Road, Valley and College Highway. So there'll be a public hearing for that on, uh, in October. I have one warrant from Richard Harris and it has to do with all the work he had done um, the past month. Uh, in uh, August, all of that review that he did to send the stuff to ECODE, which entailed quite a bit of work. And he, his invoice for uh, the month of August uh, is $900. So I'm looking for a motion to approve that warrant. Um, I'm looking to approve the warrant um, for the invoice as presented by Richard Harris. Second. The motion's been made by Sarah, second by Dan. All in favor, Dan? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And I say aye, 300. Other than that, I don't have anything, any committee reports, anybody wants to share or updates on anything? I was just uh, wondering if the transition for the, the PVPC had worked for you, Sarah. Yes, I have a meeting scheduled cool. with, um, what's the director's name there? I just was emailing. Um, 
trying to pull it. So, um, Kimberly Robinson, I have a meet and greet with her next week. Oh. Just a half hour. She just, I guess, I'm not sure exactly what's about, to be honest, more than an introduction. But, but sure. yeah, I have all the documents and I'm getting everything. So. Oh, good. I'm glad that worked out. Thanks. Keep in mind, Sarah, just don't forget what I said. Watch the agenda. And if you, I know you're a busy gal and you've got a young family. So see the agenda. If there's anything pertinent that uh, we need to, to know where we can uh, use in, in our behalf here, then. Yeah, I mean, no, I appreciate that. Otherwise, you know, if it's whatever, just don't be afraid to uh, use yourself. <clears throat> Sounds good. Thank you. Um, right. Anything else? Other than that, I'm going to say ask for an adjournment. Motion. I don't have anything. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Joy, anything from your behalf? No. no. Okay. Have a good night. See you next month. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers.